Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Łukasz and together with Michał we would like to talk about uh, the challenges in, in natural language processing uh, in the context of Polish and other Slavic languages. And that's because uh, we feel that um, there is a lot of th there is uh, a lot ha happening in the area of NLP now, but it mostly concerns uh, English and uh, most publications concern English. It's of course natural because mm, English has uh, a lot of um, a lot more speakers than, than Polish, but but Polish and other Slavic languages uh, seem to be mm, somewhat uh, under-resourced and um, uh, under-developed in, in, the, in the context of, of uh, automatic processing. And uh, I also feel that it's a nice continuation of the, of the previous talk because we're going to get somewhat deeper in, in, in the context of problems that concern um, Slavic languages in particular in, in automatic processing. So uh, let us begin by saying a few words about us. We are both uh, involved in, in several different projects and, and endeavors. Uh, we are both uh, mm, uh, doing research projects at uh, EPPAN, this is uh, Institute of Computer Science, uh, Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, it's uh, in, in particular the, mm, uh, the Linguistic Engineering Group. Uh, I, I'm, I'm also involved in, in consulting, uh, data science consulting at SIGDELTA and also um, uh, at the management team at, at SAGES, which does um, uh, data science, also data science uh, trainings. And I, I'm also involved in um, postgraduate studies, uh, big data postgraduate studies at the Warsaw University of Technology, uh, where I'm a program committee member and also a t teacher. Uh, and my hashtags, so uh, what I'm most interested in um, is uh, NLP, obviously, and machine learning and education. Um, Michał, as I said, is also uh, involved at um, research projects at EBPAN, but also at the Warsaw University of Technology and uh, the Warsaw School of Economics. And he does also machine learning and uh, deep learning and, and, um, and is an avid programmer. So, um, so maybe to, to make the stage, uh, uh, let's ask uh, how many of you are doing um, NLP in, in any way, professionally or, okay. Um, how many of you uh, are doing NLP in other languages than English? Okay, so that's a considerable amount, but also smaller than, than those who, who uh, do it for English. I hope that, that it will be also interesting for you. Um, so um, let's start by ma making an obvious uh, observation. Uh, it's, it was also uh, mentioned earlier mm, uh, by Sebastian in during the earlier talk that uh, nowadays NLP is everywhere and we have commercial projects, commercial products which are potentially being used by uh, thousands or, or millions of people. Uh, which need these uh, NLP tasks that were previously solved in, in academia, they, they need it to, to, to function, so it, it has to be implemented uh, in a commercial product in a way that it, it works um, with regular people. So, so for example, this, this home um, uh, assistants, uh, they, they need speech recognition to understand what, what are you talking about uh, to them, and they need um, probably question answering to, to correlate your answer with, with some, your question with some answer. Uh, and it's, uh, so, so this NLP is, um, is needed in, uh, in B2, B2C products, but also in, in B2B. Uh, for example, if you are a company which uh, needs to monitor your, um, your brand on the internet, you wants to know uh, what, what are the opinions of, of, of your brand uh, or your products on the internet, and you would like to mm, uh, automatically scan these opinions and uh, Facebook mentions or, or on, on other, other um, uh, social media, then you would need uh, such NLP tasks as uh, sentiment analysis or named entity recognition to, to actually recognize that, that they are speaking about you and maybe coreference resolution to, um, to analyze more complicated sentences. But there are, of course, many other tasks such as event identification, sensor disambiguation or information extraction that are also very much used 
uh, everywhere now commercially. So this is happening, but it's, it mostly concerns um, English, and there are many problems with, with processing other languages, especially Slavic languages, uh, which makes it more difficult, and uh, we don't see so many um, products and implementations in, in, the, in these uh, in this, uh, languages uh, around. So let's see what, what these problems are. So at first, mm, there is um, inherent difficulty in, in uh, Polish and other Slavic languages, that is, they are highly inflected. So the, there is this uh, linguistic notion of, uh, of a morpheme, that uh, uh, a word consists of something called morpheme, and this morpheme is, um, can encode actually several different meanings, and that, that leads to ambiguity. And ambiguity is the main source of, of difficulty in, in processing natural language. So, for example, mm, if, we, um, if we look at, uh, if, uh, at the word człowiek, uh, which is human, uh, if we have an, um, an inflected language, uh, that, uh, that means that we have uh, um, the phenomenon of declension. And um, one consequence is that we will have uh, very much larger number of possible word forms in a uh, language corpora corpus than, for example, in English, because uh, this all, on, all, this, um, um, uh, all these forms uh, in, in each of the grammatical case may appear in a corpus, um, and uh, this uh, multiplies the number of, of possible word forms for this particular word. Another uh, problem is, is this uh, ambiguity that uh, uh, several forms are shared between uh, different cases and grammatical numbers. So, for example, człowieka may be either a genitive case or um, accusative case, and you cannot really tell by looking at the word is, uh, uh, itself which case this is. Um, and, of course, there is also another problem with the proper word homonymy. So, uh, proper word homonymy is the problem that the same word in its um, nominative may um, encode completely different um, meanings. It's only, um, 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 it's only uh, en encoded in, in the same way, it's written in the same way, but it's actually a completely different meaning. So we have uh, admiral here, which can either be a uh, novel rank or um, a species of a butterfly, and these two words may share some word forms in their the declension tables, but um, a, and this leads to another f form of ambiguity. So so we uh, don't know um, which case this this is, or uh, even which actual word we are talking about here. Another problem: Polish. Uh, as a free word order, and uh, that means that uh, in, where in the case of English you can say um, John loves Mary, that, that's about it. Uh, in Polish, of course, this uh, most standard form uh, where you have subject and verb and object is the most common, Jan kocha Maria, but you can uh, also say Jan Maria kocha, Maria kocha Jan, and so on. All these possibilities are um, are okay, linguistically speaking. They are less um, often, uh, but they are not uh, errors in, in any way. And they often uh, appear in um, spoken language or, um, or in informal speech. So we have to take this into consideration. Um, and uh, having this free word order, many um, fixed context systems like HMMs, which um, take uh, this uh, fixed uh, order of words as granted do not work here very well. So another problem we have to cope with. So let's take this uh, to a uh, specific example of one of NLP tasks, part of speech tagging. Part of speech tagging is a task of marking up words in text um, with correspond corresponding um, uh, parts of speech. So, uh, if you remember from, from school, um, 
that uh, dog is a noun, that that would be the simplest form of, of part of speech tagging. But in, in reality, we need a more complicated tag set because we also want to encode such information as uh, what is the, the tense of, of a particular word or what is the grammatical number. So even in English, we have a tag set of, uh, of at least uh, 36 tags um, to, to choose from, and we use these tags to, um, to encode each of the words. But um, in Polish, this is uh, uh, mm, uh, 100 times more complicated. So uh, two magnitudes, uh, two, two orders of uh, magnitudes uh, more complicated than in English, because in Polish we have 4,000 theor theoretically possible tags. So this uh, highly uh, inflected character of, of Polish and other Slavic languages. Um, as a co consequence, uh, creates the, the situation where we have this um, tag set which is um, two orders of magnitude larger. So the similar situation happens in Czech and in Slovene where we have 2,000 possible tags. So even looking at that, you can um, probably predict that using machine learning to, to solve these tasks is, is very much difficult, more difficult. So, uh, how does this tag set look like? In Polish, it's, it's uh, positional. So, uh, where we had uh, in English um, single tags like an N uh, to encode the particular part of speech, in Polish, we have a, a sequence of tags, uh, and the first part of, of this tag is, um, is a grammatical class where we have 35 possibilities, but the next positions are attributes of, of this. Um, of this grammatical class, and some of them are uh, required, some of them are optional, and uh, multiplying all these possibilities leads us to this uh, number of 4,000 possible tag values. Uh, in fact, only around 1,000 appear in, um, in the real world corpus, but it, it, it is uh, a lot, as, as you can tell. You can also see uh, at this example uh, the case of um, of this ambiguity. So if you have uh, the word mam, you cannot really tell whether it is uh, mama or mamich or miech uh, looking at the word itself. You need uh, to look at the wider context to, uh, to, to disambiguate uh, this, uh, this particular word. So this is, uh, this is the example of, of the problem uh, mentioned earlier. As a bonus, we also have uh, uh, segmentation amb ambiguities, uh, uh, when we look at uh, word segmentation, the, they are not very common, but because of uh, the way Polish works and uh, how the taxet is constructed, the, the sentence um, coś zrobił, which is very simple, only two words, may be either interpreted as what have you done or did he do anything. So uh, uh, the way you, you look at it, it may mean completely different things. And it, also the, it is also uh, the obligation of the tagger to make this distinction and look at even wider context to uh, uh, tell which segmentation is, is the correct one. So when we look at the um, real, realistic uh, um, uh, accuracies of, of existing taggers, we can see that these problems translate to a um, big difference between English and Polish. So in English, the current uh, accuracy of, of taggers is, is exceeding 97%. Uh, in Polish, the state of the art in, in 2007 was that uh, the best tagger, which was rule-based, uh, uh, had uh, around 88% tagging accuracy. It, in 2010, uh, Brill Tagger was adapted to, to Polish. Uh, Brill Tagger is a simple algorithm which works very well for English, but in case of, of Polish, um, it only mm, uh, allowed us to achieve around 89 per tagging accuracy. And 2012 uh, gave us several taggers which used uh, various uh, data, um, various mas machine learning approaches to, to solve this task. Uh, there were a memory-based tagger and uh, at least two conditional random fields based taggers and these uh, this allowed us to achieve uh, around 91 tagging accuracy so as, as you see this is uh, not enough it's it's still very much um, below this this baseline or um, mm, um, 
um, this, this um, amount that, that uh, English tigers achieve. So uh, what we have tried in 2014, uh, we use this simple trick that is uh, used in, um, in, in classification world, that is uh, we combine several tigers together. So we used ensembling to, uh, to try to predict these um, uh, uh, tags uh, based on the answers of, uh, of uh, several um, um, individual tigers. And because the, each of the tigers may make different mistakes, uh, the theoretical um, accuracy of such combined tiger could achieve uh, around 96% of accuracy if we could magically select the correct tiger each time a decision is made. Of course, this is, it is difficult to, to find this algorithm. We have tried me meta-learning, which is uh, not shown here and uh, gives us around 92% of accuracy. Uh, I'm sorry, 93% of accuracy. When we do simple voting, so we just uh, select the majority of answers as, um, uh, as the final answer, we, we get around 92% of accuracy. But it is still not enough, because 92% uh, of, of accuracy means that 8%, we have 8% of errors, so in a corpus of, of 1 billion words, there are 80 million um, mistakes. So uh, another problem here is that we have very limited uh, language resources. Uh, because uh, when we use uh, supervised learning methods, we have to train them on some data. And these data need to be um, hand annotated. So it's, it's a very expensive process when, when linguists uh, manually tag each, each word. And uh, even uh, tagging one million words uh, was a uh, you know, big endeavor uh, and very costly. And uh, of course, if we had more data, probably these methods would give us better results, but it, it's, uh, it's uh, at, at a cost. So uh, what we have uh, uh, come up with, we, um, we wanted to see uh, whether uh, making a Kaggle-like competition can help to, to solve this problem. So we um, organized something called Poleval, uh, which is, uh, in, in the scientific world, it, it's called uh, um, shared tasks, so many researchers uh, uh, work on, on, the, on the same task and, and try to, to beat the baseline. Uh, if you are familiar with, with Kaggle, so you, you can compare it to Kaggle. So we basically prepared a, a training test, we prepared a um, test data set which, is not, which was not known to the participants and, uh, and we opened a uh, part of speech tagging uh, task and the sentiment analysis task. And we had 16 submissions from nine different teams. And uh, the, the first surprising factor, maybe not so su surprising, was that all submissions were based on neural networks. And um, uh, uh, as you can probably predict, uh, um, based on the hype of um, deep learning and so on, these deep learning methods performed very well. So uh, while the uh, previous baseline was uh, this CRF-based tagger, which uh, achieved around 91% accuracy, uh, these uh, new deep network, uh, deep learning uh, methods c could, um, uh, could uh, um, surpass this, this, this baseline by more than uh, three percentage points, so the best method achieved 94.6% um, uh, of accuracy on this test data that, that we uh, gave to the participants. And I wanted to uh, highlight the uh, main differences between the, the methods that, that participated in the, in the competition, because all the previous methods were um, not deep network based, uh, they had handcrafted uh, features, and in the case of, of the new submissions, uh, they were mostly deep neural networks. Uh, some of them used uh, handcrafted features, and one of them used uh, word-level embeddings, so um, word-to-vec, basically. And actually, this, this method was the best, so this combination of uh, handcrafted rules and, and word embeddings uh, um, proved to, to perform best. So. Um, what does it tell us? Uh, for one thing, uh, deep learning and word embeddings seem to, to be the key to, uh, to really achieve uh, high accuracy in this difficult situation of a language that is uh, 
that has this uh, in inherent difficulties in wi with grammar. But um, you need a lot of training data to really uh, work with uh, deep learning. And um, um, as I said, Polish is, is a limited uh, um, resources language. And some questions arise. Uh, for one, uh, which embeddings are, are the best for, for Slavic languages? Should I use word to vec or maybe some, some other new additions to, to, the, uh, to the choice of, of options uh, here? Or should, what, what parameters should be used? Or how do I even calculate and use the embeddings? Should I use orthographic forms or, or some other features that, uh, that I, I will base my, my uh, embeddings on? So we made some experiments on a completely different task, uh, the task of, of uh, event identification in, in text, where we also had a, a deep learning approach. But we wanted to, to show how the, some, some of the parameters um, influence the accuracy of, of such a system. So uh, starting with the mm, uh, size of the corpus that you train your word embeddings on, you see that uh, uh, you need uh, at least um, uh, 10 million word corpus to um, to get uh, embeddings that are uh, really valuable for, for your task. So, so this size of, of the, the data that, uh, that is available for you uh, is very important here. Another uh, question is uh, what size of my embedding should be? So the, one of the most uh, common size is, um, is a vector size of 300. That it's, this is indeed um, uh, s something that's, um, that gives us uh, uh, result that, that we can rely on. But that translates to a longer training time and uh, higher uh, memory requirements. Another thing is how do we actually calculate the embeddings? So for English, the, the most uh, common way is to use orthographic forms. But I, as I said earlier, mm, uh, in, in languages uh, which are highly inflected, you have um, a very different distribution of words in a corpus than in English. So uh, they are very much, uh, they are sparser, you, you can say. So uh, uh, um, the problem of um, small uh, training data set is, is even uh, bigger because uh, uh, they are so, so different, uh, the, the word forms are, are so much uh, different in uh, um, because you, you can you, the, because of the fact that you have declension. So uh, in this test, uh, what we have uh, seen that uh, using embeddings on orthographic forms uh, doesn't really give you the, the best results that that you can achieve. And um, for example, combining orthographic um, combining orthographic forms. Uh, or uh, I'm sorry, combining or, um, lemmas with um, uh, um, orthographic forms is, is much better, uh, or even combining lemmas with um, part of speech tags, because y you, um, you, you take these um, base forms of words, which are mo more common in, in a corpus, with grammatical information. There is also um, an, uh, an example here with uh, fast text vectors. These are uh, said to perform well with uh, inflected languages because they take subword information into account. So uh, not the word as a whole, but, but uh, subword information, which is important in, in, in uh, inflected languages because of this notion of, of a morpheme. In, and in fact, these uh, fact, fast, uh, fast text uh, vectors calculated on the, um, on the base of um, orthographic forms and lemmas, and also uh, using uh, grammatical uh, class information, uh, allowed us to, to achieve uh, best results in this task of, of even identification. Another question is, uh, uh, how um, is the original annotation quality in, in, my, uh, in my data uh, important when I train word embeddings uh, on uh, grammatical features? So uh, whether my data is hand, hand annotated by linguists or is it annotated uh, using taggers? And to, to our surprise, uh, this was not so important, so that the size of the corpus is, is um, has um, much greater influence than the, the fact that um, uh, the, the quality is, is lower. So we are you are better off using larger data set than very much um, mm, uh, than, than using a smaller data set, but hand annotated. Uh, 
in the context of training word embeddings. So in conclusions, uh, Slavic languages uh, do pose uh, a more difficult problem in processing than, than English. And uh, some of the key points that we observed was the, the size of the training uh, data uh, for your task and for word embeddings is, is the key. So, so you have to have a lot of data. Uh, deep learning and word embeddings are, are not only the, the hype, but they actually w work very well here also. But handcrafted features work very well alongside these, these embeddings. So, so your domain knowledge uh, is, is still important. So you're still better off understanding what, what you are doing, uh, understanding the language you are processing, and combining these handcrafted um, features with embeddings. Um, it's uh, also important to, to remember that embeddings can be calculated not only on the base of orthographic forms, but also other features. And y you should do that, so, so it, it really helps. And you, you should also try different uh, embedding variants, because you have word to vec you have Glove, you, um, you have fast text, and uh, that, that may lead to, to better accuracy. And you, are, of course, need a lot of tuning and hyperparameter optimization. So if you want to try this on your own, uh, I will leave you with some uh, links that, that you can uh, start. Uh, some are very well known, for example, frameworks for deep learning, um, framework for where, uh, calculating word embeddings, uh, GenSim. But if you need uh, pre-built models for Polish, that, um, then you can uh, find them here. I also thank Sebastian for uh, pointing to our web page, the web page of our team at uh, EPPAN at the earlier presentation. So th this is, um, this is uh, still the, 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 same, uh, the same site. Uh, if you, need, uh, to, if you would, would like to see the existing Tagger implementations, also those uh, submitted to Poleval, uh, this is the of official web page. Uh, and uh, if you need textual resources in Polish, uh, the biggest one is the National Corpus of Polish, which, which is hand annotated, also Polish Corpus of the 1960s, and the data set that was prepared for the Poleval competition. And also, uh, you can of course use an un annotated large data sets from, from Wikipedia or, or Common Crawl, which is a project uh, concerned with, with uh, downloading websites from all over the world in, in particular language. Okay, so thank you very much and welcome questions. Okay, one question. We don't have much time, but one question will do. Thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask, can you please comment on the state of the art of uh, stemming and lemmatization for Polish language at the moment? Okay, so the situation is not very bright <laughs> uh, because no one uh, really focused on the problem of, of uh, lemmatization. There, there are some stemmers. Um, there, there is this morphologic um, stemmer and lemmatizer, but they are not very accurate. So, so stemmers are, are, are not very accurate, uh, of course, but, but the lemmatizer is, uh, is rather simple. And the problem is because of the, um, the, the character of, of, uh, of Slavic languages, uh, lemmatization is equally hard than part of speech tagging. So to achieve high quality lemmatization around 98%, you need the, the same process uh, as in tagging. So you need to take context into account, various features. Uh, and uh, these taggers that I was talking about here, they also do lemmatization. They, they do it around 97, 98%, but this is not a simple tool that you, um, that, that, that it's 100 kilobytes and you run it from the console and it works. They are uh, machine learning models uh, and neural networks. So, so expect to, to have to download uh, uh, several megabyte uh, um, model and, and so on. And, and it takes time. So if you want to perform lemmatization, uh, high quality lemmatization, it will take time and you will need these, these taggers to do this. If you would like to make it uh, quickly and you are not so much concerned with quality, you can use stemmers, maybe this morphologic um, lemmatizer also. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions, but um, I uh, think yeah. that you can catch both yeah. guys uh, on a break, coffee break in, in an hour or something. We are here the whole day and, and in the evening, so we welcome any questions. Yeah. 
Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.